In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am afraid, Lord. I am afraid of saying yes. Where will you take me? I am afraid of drawing the longest straw. I am afraid of signing my name to an unread agreement. I am afraid of the yes that entails other yeses. I am not at peace. You pursue me, Lord. You besiege me. I run after noise for fear of hearing you. But in a moment of silence, you slip through. I turn from the road, for I have caught sight of you. But at the end of the path, you are waiting for me. Where shall I hide? I meet you everywhere. Is it then impossible to escape you? Son, I want more for you and for the world. Until now, you have planned your actions, but I have no need of them. You've asked for my approval. You've asked for my support. You've wanted to interest me in your work. But don't you see, son, that you've been reversing the roles. I've watched you. I've seen your good will. And I want more than you now. You will no longer do your own works, but the will of your Father in heaven. Say yes, son. I need your yes, as I needed Mary's yes to come to earth. For it is I that must do your work. It is I who must live in your family. It is I who must be in your neighborhood and not you. For it is my look that penetrates and not yours. My life that transforms and not yours. Give all to me. Abandon all to me. I need your yes to be united with you and to come down to earth. I need your yes to continue saving the world. O oh Lord, I am afraid of your demands, but who can resist you? That your kingdom may come and not mine, that your will may be done and not mine. Help me to say yes. I hate the person that strolls up to me and says, can I ask you a question? I have two responses to that. The first is that grammatically the person should have said, may I ask you a question, rather than can I ask you a question. Once I've got over that, then it's easier to say, no, you can't. Because, of course, it gets you into a terrible position. But if you say uh, no, you can wheel back from that. You can become gracious when you realize that you can actually say yes. And you can start being nice and smile. And bishops like to do that. You can actually say, well, yes, in indeed, I can probably do that for you. Or... Yes, I do understand. The story of Mary's yes is an interesting one. As I've preached before, angels can be quite terrifying things. And here is Mary sitting alone, and the archangel Gabriel turns up and says, Good morning. A good start, really. The angel immediately expresses why he has arrived. Mary is to have a child. Mary's answer is quite straightforward. That's going to be a bit difficult because I'm a virgin. You can almost hear the exasperation of the angel when he has to go into more detail. It was a perfectly straightforward message. Why do I have to give the second and third paragraphs? The sigh and then the long explanation of what's going to happen. piece that you heard read by Matthew 
and Joe at the beginning of this sermon was by Michel Coist. A glance round the congregation will mean that some of you are just about old enough to remember who Michel Coist was. In the 60s, he was the thing. He was a French Roman Catholic priest working in the Diocese of Rouen, and he wrote a very special book called Prayers of Life. They're wonderful. They're French and they're angst-ridden, page after page after page of anxiety. But they are amazing. They touch our way of life. They touch our faith, the things which concern us. In the passage you heard read, which was only half of the prayer, there was a big bit of angst I cut out of the middle because I didn't think you were up for it on a Sunday morning. You hear him struggling with his own vocation. The idea of coming across God. I love the idea of turning upside from the road because you've seen God down there ahead of you. How many of you have done that when you're out shopping, when you've spotted somebody you don't meet and have suddenly gone into a shop, desperately interested in electronics after all, in order not to see the person? And yet Coist takes us and says, yes, but you've turned down a side street, and who's waiting for you at the end? God. And that wonderful business of making a lot of noise so that you can't hear God speaking But then in a moment of silence, God slips in with his word, waiting for that silence. Mary's yes was an interesting one, because she didn't actually know what was in store for her. But the angel ends with that this conversation is over line, for nothing is impossible with God. When an angel has said that to you, there's not much point in arguing. There is nothing impossible with God. And yet there it is. And Mary hears that. She hears that statement from God that whatever happens, God is with her. For nothing is impossible with him. Mary doesn't bring her own agenda. Looking at Michel Coy's prayer... God actually argues that most of the time he listens to our agendas, desperately trying to work out how he can bring his kingdom in around our own agendas, all the things we want to do. The Church of England is really good at it. We're forever writing strategies. I always hope that they're laid out somewhere for God to read beforehand so that he can put a tick at the bottom and say, yes, that's okay, that looks about right. But somehow I don't think that happens. We're busy writing our own agendas about what the kingdom of heaven will actually look like, what it's supposed to be, where it will go, what God is doing in our lives. And God says, yes, I've been listening I've been listening to what you want me to back up, but now it's going to change. Now you are going to do my will. You are going to work for my kingdom and not yours. Hear a bit of that prayer again. Say yes, son. I need your yes as I needed Mary's yes to come to earth. For for it is I that must do your work. It is I who must live in your family. It is I who must be in your neighborhood and not you. For it is my look that penetrates and not yours. My life that transforms and not yours. Give all to me. Abandon all to me. I need your yes to be united with you and to come down to earth, I need your yes to continue saving the world. And that's the terrifying part of it. God needs our yes to continue his work of salvation. He's going to do it through you and through me, 
through our deeds and our words, through what the church looked like, through what we do in our politics, through what we do in our daily lives, God will reveal himself, his plan, his kingdom, not yours and not mine. At the beginning of the prayer, there's that wonderful line about signing up to an unknown agreement. Well, if ever there was an unknown agreement, it's the Christian life. We set out on it, but where's it actually going to take us? I'm afraid of that yes that will involve me in other yeses. Yes, I'll go this far, but no further. But God wants abandonment. Isn't that a terrifying word, abandonment? I recently recounted how, as a young curate, I played one of those dreadful games where you all stood round in a circle and somebody stood in the middle blindfolded and they fell towards the people round the edge, knowing that they would catch them. Knowing that they would catch them? Curates in the Church of England? What a, th what a thought. We only let one person crash to the ground in my group. And, of course, he deserved it. But abandonment? Are you going to abandon yourself to God? Because that's what he's asking. For nothing is impossible with him. The example of Mary is an amazing one. Because when she gets to visit Elizabeth, what does she do? She sings. She sings a song. And many of us, when we get to that point of joy in our lives, break into song. Some of us tunefully, some of us untunefully. But it doesn't actually matter. Because we break into song because that's how we express our joy. And she glimpsed the kingdom of God. She glimpsed what it was going to be like. A world turned upside down. And that's what God asks of you. Abandon yourself and just see where he leads you. Abandon yourself because nothing is impossible with God.